Just like to uh, welcome you all again to another in our series of uh, interviews uh, with the experts. Uh, I'm Malcolm Bell, I'm the Vice Chair for the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine uh, here at Mayo Clinic Rochester. And it's my distinct uh, pleasure and privilege, privilege to have Dr. Alan Jaffe uh, with us uh, today. Uh, Dr. Jaffe is a professor of medicine and a professor of uh, laboratory medicine and pharmacology, uh, who I think everyone uh, may appreciate is an expert uh, with uh, the topic of troponins. And he's been involved with this right from the very uh, beginning in, in their development. Uh, so I can't think of anyone better to, to have with us today uh, to discuss the role of uh, high sensitivity cardiac troponin uh, in the setting of myocardial infarction. So Alan, uh, welcome. Uh, today. Thank you very much, Malcolm. It's my pleasure. Okay. Well, let's just start with uh, just the terminology here. High sensitivity uh, cardiac troponin. Uh, just tell us why is that different to the uh, previous assays of sensitive cardiac troponin? Well, they're, they're in point of fact more sensitive. As a matter of fact, most of the prior assays didn't detect values in normals. These high sensitivity assays, by definition, have to detect normal values uh, in at least 50% of men and women so that you can tell they're much more sensitive. Now, how mo much more sensitive depends on the, how sensitive the prior assay was, but they're much, they're substantially more sensitive. And indeed, as we've done that, we found that the normal values for people are really quite low. So we really do need these high sensitivity assays to detect most normal individuals and therefore the minor increases that can occur as well. And, and I guess it, we could assume then with much more precision. With much greater precision, their, their criteria are that they have to have a good coefficient of variation. That is to say, not a lot of, of imprecision at the 99th percentile value. Okay, so as, as we think about uh, the use of uh, these assays in uh, myocardial infarction, um, what are the principles that are going to guide clinicians or should guide clinicians as they're thinking about uh, using this assay uh, in that setting? Well, there are two or three important issues, uh, I think, to take into account. Um, the first is that in assessing patients, you want to have a pretest probability of what you think ischemic heart disease, what the likelihood of ischemic heart disease is. The vast majority of additional increases in troponin will not be in the ischemic heart disease patients. They'll be in patients who have other diseases who are acutely ill and may have elevations or for other mechanisms. And that's terribly important in its own sense in the sense that we're learning that there are lots of things that can damage the heart. And in the long run, those things will need to be addressed, but they're a different topic for a different time. A second principle is that if you have an analytic problem where you don't, the values just don't fit your patient. With these highly sensitive assays, there are a fair number of analytic problems that can occur. I'm not gonna go over the, any of them in detail, but a good laboratory should be able to troubleshoot those if indeed you notify them and you say, this value doesn't make sense. It's either elevated when it shouldn't be or it's normal when it shouldn't be. They can look at that. Finally, you've got to know your own assay. Different assays will have different problems. Troponin T detects far more people with elevations in the critically ill and in patients with renal failure, then there's cardiac troponin I, and they have different analytic problems with them that can come up between the, the two of them. For example, troponin T is lowered by hemolysis. Many of the troponin I assays, if you get a lot of hemolysis, might be increased. So you've got to figure out what your local assay is and how to use it optimally. So that brings up a really good uh, point. Maybe we'll just come back to the T versus I here in a moment, or maybe versus not really. Yeah, you know, it's, the, it's the comparison, isn't it? But so really, you're talking about uh, 
in that acute myocardial infarction setting, but you've got other patients who are critically ill who may not actually be having a myocardial infarction and, and an elevation of their troponin actually may indicate that this is just myocardial injury rather than infarction. Did, is that fair to say? Absolutely. And that's where a lot of the confusion comes in, of course. Uh, you know, someone who comes in with pneumonia and, and then that troponin is elevated and, and then the cardiology team gets involved and there's a question about, you know, what to do with that patient. That's obviously, a, you know, a, a very common you know, scenario. So just playing devil's advocate, you know, from, from a cardiologist standpoint, is there a benefit or harm in using the troponin T assay versus troponin I? You know, would there be less confusion uh, among patients who are presenting uh, with without myocardial infarction and, and more an injury related to their concomitant disease. In the ischemic heart disease realm, the sensitivity and specificity of those assays is very similar. However, it is true that cardiac troponin T is more apt to be elevated in other causes over and above that of cardiac troponin I. That's well reported. Now, that doesn't mean one is better or one is not better. One could argue that that detecting myocardial injury is important whenever one detects it. Uh, but from the MI point of view, uh, troponin T therefore is gonna give one what cardiologists might call a little bit of additional noise. I think the important concept though, that has gotten lost is that you need to have a clinical situation where you really have ischemia and what happens so often is we say, oh, well, this patient has tachycardia. That has to be supply, demand, and balance. And ischemia isn't even present. So I think most of us would argue that what one, the clinical cardiologist needs to do is to insist on specificity of the increase for the ischemic heart disease patient. That's not something troponin can give you, whether it's I or T. It's something you have to get from your own clinical gestalt. That's a really good point. And so um, obviously with, you know, the question about myocardial infarction, I mean, we're looking for some, you know, evidence of ischemia. I mean, you know, presentation with chest pain, ECG changes, maybe some imaging uh, non-invasively that, that might help you with that. And I, I think we both agree it's not always easy, but uh, but we should make that uh, attempt to really uh, work out what the underlying you know, uh, problem is. So let, let's just then move on, Alan. Um, in terms of the utility of this in the emergency department, so we're not necessarily talking about when they've been admitted to the hospital, the intensive care, but in that first presentation, and let's just talk about the patient who's presenting with chest pain, you know, with or without uh, abnormalities on their ECG, and obviously ST elevation. I mean, that's a that's a that's a different uh, you know, situation, and we know what to do with that. We, we think. But with respect to rapid rule out and rapid rule in, I mean, that seems to be where a lot of the uh, advantages of high sensitive troponin lie. Could you expand on that? Maybe just start with the rapid rule in. The rapid rule in that has been used in Europe has suggested a very high value would rule one in. Now, if one is taking an all comers group, as we do in the United States, where a lot of the critically ill patients get troponins and because people are worried about type two type events, then <clears throat> those values need to go up very much higher. But if you take the classic person whose present presentation says, I'm just here because I need, have chest pain and that's the only evaluation that's necessary, a value of 53, which is for troponin T, what's been advocated by the European Society, gives you about an 80% rule-in rate, a value of 100, which is what we use at the Mayo Clinic, to take into account the fact that there are so many other people who are not classic presenters who will have elevations, gives you a, a rule-in rate for the classic presenter of over 90%. So a very high value in the classic situation can give you a diagnosis very quickly. And if that number were smaller, then at what point are you gonna measure another one to see whether or not there's a significant rise? So 
you know, you, you talked about a value of a hundred or so, but let's say someone has a value of 20, for example, the troponin T, what do you do with that number? Well, well, that, that situation. That's, that's an evaluation where the rule in metrics suggests that one should get a second value. We get it at two hours. Some, the ESC algorithm suggests you can do it as early as an hour, but that gives you a very tiny, small difference. And if you look at these assays, some of them in particularly at lower levels aren't precise enough to do that. So we took the safer route, which was to go with the two hour protocol, which gives you a difference. And if you get a substantial difference, the difference we use is 10 to rule in, four to rule out. And there obviously that is a middle ground of about 10 to 15% of patients will give you that rule in. The one other caveat for that is you need to be somewhat later. You, if you've come in within 30 minutes, this may be a difficult triage to make. You need to come in within two or three hours as indicated in the ESC guideline. Beyond that, you can start to rely both on single sample rule out and single sample rule in. Okay, so you're, you're advising not to necessarily embrace that zero to one algorithm, but more the zero to two hour algorithm. And now let's just, uh, and you brought up, you know, the rule out. So maybe just walk us through carefully there. You know, can you rule out with a single uh, assay, uh, well, a single measurement, uh, or do we have to wait for that two hour? There are pretty good data from Europe that, it, that you can rule out with a single sample. One of the problems in the United States is that depending upon the assay, the FDA has restricted the use, the, the reporting of low values. So for troponin T, that value is five, and we're only allowed to report down to six. So the question then is the higher you get, the more problematic this becomes. So it's assay dependent, and we did not go with the single sample rule out because of that, because six has some confidence intervals around it because it's a lower value. So it could be eight or four. The data that is coming out suggests, however, that even then this works pretty well. The caveat is that there are certain subsets of patients you need to be careful about, and they're no surprise. They're the elderly, and they're individuals who have known cardiovascular comorbidities, known coronary disease or heart failure. If indeed you don't use a single sample rule out, then you can rule out almost invariably within two hours by looking for a change in the values over time. And that in and of itself reduces compared to the previous assay about four hours worth of time. Not only that, it's a much more secure rule out, which is why so many people can be sent home without having to do a lot of the ancillary tests we used to do so frequently in the emergency department. So that brings us uh, maybe to the, the final discussion point here is about resource utilization and patient flow and efficiency. Um, what, what have we learned to, in our experience here at Mayo Clinic just in terms of the flow of patients in ED? And again, we're just talking about patients who you know, have presented with chest pain uh, that uh, you know we're, we're questioning whether or not this is unstable angina or non-cardiac pain or it's a true MI. Well, I think the first thing to say is that there, the, before we even go there, is that there is an S element of clinical care that we need to be careful about. There are two subsets that clearly still exist. Unstable angina clearly still exists. You, if you just use the troponin values and not look at the clinical presentation, you will miss some such people. And the second is that late presenters, because the downslope of the time concentration curve, and when I say late, maybe after 12 hours, is much slower, one might not see a rapid decline. So if one sees an elevation that is not declining in a patient with an appropriate history, be careful. What we've seen at Mayo is consistent with the rest of the literature in terms of resource utilization. More people are sent home securely without additional testing. Therefore, the frequency of stress testing, echocardiography and the like has not gone up. Even angiography has not gone up very much because most of the patients 
who would have had angiography were listed as unstable angina and have become now non-semis because we've detected them to a much better extent. Now, there's one caveat with that, which is that resource utilization ought to go up, not in the ED because these people are safe and they've ruled out, but in the outpatient setting, because individuals who have elevated troponins, even if they rule out, have some cardiovascular comorbidity. And it is incumbent upon us as cardiologists to look for that comorbidity with the hope that if, when we find one, we'll treat it. Hypertension, for example, with a little bit of a troponin elevation is a, a very high risk circumstance that's worthy of evaluation even after discharge from the ED. Well, I think you're just, uh, I think we'll end there, uh, but Alan, I think that brings up a, you know, a really important uh, you know, group of uh, patients that uh, we still struggle with. And, and I think that's maybe a topic uh, for future discussion and, and an important one. So I, I want to thank you for uh, uh, explaining you know, how we utilize uh, you know, this important test. And also uh, thank you for uh, really I guess emphasizing the the pitfalls or the caveats there with uh, interpreting this uh, test result. So thank you so much uh, for your time today, and uh, look forward to another discussion about troponin in some other disease states.